So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, we are excited to offer you tonight this webinar on grazing uh, principles and practices related to smaller land holdings. So the ideas that we're going to present tonight are ones that hopefully if you've got um, a small land holding with livestock or with animals or that you have or that you're hoping to add um, into your into your life, that uh, some of the concepts that we'll talk about tonight uh, will be helpful for you to not only have healthy pastures, but also healthy animals, happy animals and a We'll say I'll say with with optimism a lower stress life when you're thinking about what thinking about your grass and and your animals. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I want to do is um, maybe get a little bit of a sense of of who's here. Now we don't have a poll set up, but just maybe in the chat and. Um, uh, Kate, I can't see the chat the way that I've got things set up. So if you can just maybe read out to me, but if people in the chat can just say kind of what sort of a landowner that you are, um, you know, what maybe what kind of animals you have, or if you don't have animals or, or something like that, that would be that'd be great in the chat. Okay, so we have um, Nikki with three horses so far. And if you don't have animals <clears throat> yet, or you're just thinking about it, you can put that in there as well. Uh, someone with four horses, Jill's here with two horses. Uh, Nikki has some compaction issues, she said in the chat. Okay. Um, Sandra has nine acres and four horses on a seasonal creek at one end. Okay, excellent. That gives me a, that gives me a, a good a good idea. So the first thing I want to do is uh, introduce, I guess, who cows and fish is. Um, and sort of why we're having this conversation. So um, we are a not-for-profit organization working um, around Alberta, and our formal name is the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. So again, non-government, a non-profit, and um, we've been working in Alberta for about 30 years. We're sort of celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, and working all around Alberta in the different regions on helping people better understand their riparian rangelands. So I've been working at it since um, 1992 as an organization. Myself, I've been with Cows and Fish uh, since about 1999 and have been um, sort of growing throughout my career in grazing and pasture management and riparian management with, uh, with Cows and Fish as we expanded from Southern Alberta up through uh, the, the, the central region and up into the Peace and Boreal. So Cows and Fish does have its roots in agriculture and um, basically inspired by the idea that producers and people that are living and working on the landscape are not always needing to be told what to do per se, but they're looking for the information to help them make the best decisions that they can. So we became sort of a bridge between science and the practical applications of, you know, range management and grazing management and how that applies to watersheds and landscapes overall. So as I mentioned, we have expanded, uh, we started out in Southwest Alberta, but have expanded over the years up through the province. And, um, you know, working with all kinds of, of landowners and land managers, whether they are in um, grazing situations, whether they are rural or urban, as well as, you know, lakefront owners, um, public land, private land, a variety and recreational op, um, recreationalists as well. So how we work with uh, people and communities on this sort of uh, riparian management and grazing um, uh, uh, applications is through what we call a thinking pathway. So it's all about sort of learning about what the issues are, figuring out who can help um, address issues, find out what tools are available or that people might need to help them um, solve a problem, and then work with uh, individuals and communities to put in some actions and then help monitor whether or not those processes are working um, or not. And then we learn something new and the um, awareness process starts all over again. And awareness is also about, you know, 
what is a riparian area? What are the grazing management principles? You know, sort of building some foundational knowledge for which to build decisions upon. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So the uh, sort of bit of an outline for, for the next um, hour and a half or so um, is going to be all about how to incorporate animals and grass or trees, depending on your landscape, and then talk a bit about specifically more about riparian areas, since that is um, a lot of where our focus lies. And we know that we've got some people here that have that have creeks or lakes or wetlands. So the idea of, you know, whether you're a large landholder or a small landholder, as ultimately, if you've got animals and you've got land, basically what your job to, is to do is to manage the rangeland ecosystem within the environment to achieve, to achieve your goals. So typically those goals are happy and healthy animals, happy and healthy pastures. So when we try to make the land do more than it is capable of doing, that's when you know, we start to lose and have issues. So if we combine you know, uh, some of the knowledge around how plants grow and how they respond to grazing with you know, what kind of plant community do I have? So what kind of actual you know, amount of grass can I expect um, to recognize whether or not a pasture is healthy or not, and then figure out sort of, okay, based on all of that, is there a threshold of how many animals I should have with the uh, land base that I, that, I, that I currently have? So the idea of, of rangeland is to ultimately kind of think about it like a bank account. It's like investing in, um, in the health of the land so that you can ultimately graze the interest off of your investment. So instead of dipping into that capital, you're, you're sort of, you know, having a, a good um, foundation and a good amount of uh, resource in your bank. And in this case, we're talking about your land, your land capability to then support however many animals that you have. So you wanna maintain that capital and live off the interest. That's all of our goals in life, I think. So when I talk about rangeland, it's land that supports vegetation consumed by livestock or wildlife that is managed as a natural ecosystem. So even though, you know, some of you may have a smaller land holding, you still have an ecosystem built within that, within that land holding. And that rangeland might include tame pastures, might include um, native pastures that are grassland based, might be forested areas, you know, like, like in the right, the right, the right photo, or it might be you know, uh, an area next to a creek or a river or a lake or a wetland that is the riparian zone. And ultimately these areas are either being managed for grazing um, every year or might be being, um, you know, utilized in different ways to, to provide rest at different times. And we're gonna talk all about that um, as we go. So before we get into, you know, the actual suggestions of how to um, do things, I want to talk a little bit about some principles. So basically lay, lay the groundwork for you. Um, you know, there's four of them that we're going to touch on. And it kind of comes down to if these four principles are being considered and followed, whatever strategy you use to achieve them can be tailored to your specific situation. So the first one is balancing your livestock needs with the forage supply. So this is ultimately what do you have and what do your animals need and do you have enough? So the idea is um, that you have uh, a, a, neat, a grazing capacity or a carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is ultimately being able to use the grass, but then leave something behind in order for other ecological functions to happen. So, you know, cool down the, to cool down the soil, trap moisture, um, provide uh, you know a good ground cover so there's not a lot of bare ground with the opportunity for weeds to get in and ultimately what's that what that's doing is helping you maintain a healthy plant community so by selecting the correct you know number of animals for the land base that you have that's going to help you have healthy grass for a long 
for a longer period of time. Because ultimately we want you to be thinking about how can I maintain this grass for the longest period of time with the fewest amount of extra inputs. So when we're talking about, you know, how do we do that? You know, how do we how do we leave some things behind? There's just some things to think about. Um, depending on the type of pasture that you have, the safe use factor is something that, depending on the type of plant community that you have, as well as the type of um, what what condition it's in, is your sort of available. Um, you want to be able to take. 25% in a forest, for example, but then make sure you leave 75% behind. And when we're, this is like your total forage um, uh, production and um, availability. Native grass is a little more resilient, uh, so you could do 25 to 50%. And tame pasture, they're designed to be grazed a little more heavily. And so, you know, you could take up to, up to 75%, um, but then leave the other 30 and allow, uh, allow for rest. And this helps to maintain um, a healthy and functioning um, ecosystem and grassland. And these are these are recommended. Uh, they're guidelines. Um, it, it, they're, and I'll, I'll uh, refer you to some tools that can help you figure out, you know, kind of where where you're at with that situation. But ultimately, what we want to try and do is leave behind leave something behind. And when I've mentioned that a couple times, what I'm referring to is litter and biomass that can then become litter. So whether it's standing grasses or, um, or, or, or stuff that's, you know, fallen down as sort of that thatch or something that's, that's left over, it's usually the dead and brown stuff. That actually is what's helping to create that healthy pasture. It also can be a forage source in particular years when grass isn't growing so well. So it's not wasted. It's um, essential to helping to uh, maintain that product, the productivity of that pasture. So what does that litter do? It, it does a, a number of things that are related to, again, the ecology and the environment that, that that grass, and this applies to trees and shrubs as well, is growing in. So things like insulating the soil surface so that it's either cooler or it's kept cooler, uh, doesn't get too hot, um, helps water slowly uh, infiltrate into the ground instead of just running away, has some cover. So then you've got uh, reduced erosion and then adds organic uh, matter like carbon and nutrients back into the soil, which is ultimately the food for those plants to, to, to grow. So that's kind of, you know, figuring out what, your, um, what, what the land can support with being able to leave some litter behind. The second principle is about <clears throat> thinking about uh, grazing during, during <clears throat> grazing at the appropriate time. So avoiding sensitive periods when we're thinking about particular, it goes for, uh, for um, grasses as well as your trees and shrubs, is typically if you grow or er, graze early in the season. So even, you know, now, this can be a time when grazing actually hurts the plant. So it's hard for that plant to, um, to, to, to sort of sustain its vigor throughout the season if we, take, um, if we take some of it off too soon. And so they're, yeah, at this time of the year, the plants are using their roots to ultimately get those green, you know, get those shoots up uh, to start turning those pastures green. And as they're growing and growing and growing, they're drawing on those root reserves and they are um, putting up those solar panels so that photosynthesis can start to recharge those roots. And as the season goes, you know, the taller that plant gets, the more uh, leaf matter that is out there, that's able to then put that energy back into the roots so that the plant can continue to grow and to recover. So ultimately what we're doing is recharging the, the battery of that plant, which is ultimately that, that underground root system, whether it's, and it doesn't matter what kind of plant it is, managing that, that sort of above ground matter and uh, below ground matter is gonna help that plant community, um, you know, help, help you thrive throughout the season, as well as tap into, you know, 
moisture or, or lower moisture uh, for drought times. So if we graze too early in the season, ultimately what ends up happening is that that plant draws on its root reserves to grow the grass first or to shoot out its, its, its leaves. But then if it's grazed, then that solar panel is, 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 is reduced and the plant continues to draw then on the root reserve as, as summer goes on. And so then it, can, uh, it doesn't have time to recharge the roots and we end up sort of lowering the energy that is in that plant. Um, in order to for it to sustain itself over the season sometimes or even you know year after year after year. So the third concept is about rest. So how do we you know achieve that um, that, uh, that allowance for the plant to grow up and, and get its solar panel going? It's really about figuring out what your rest periods are and what your grazing periods are. And typically the rest periods need to be longer than your grazing periods. So this example, uh, this photo here is, uh, is, is quite common in range management. This uh, left-hand side or my left, anyway, the one, the, the large plant with the, with the big deep roots. Um, maybe if I do, if, uh, if I show my mouse this way, you can see is little to no grazing. So you can just see that the uh, above biomass reflects what's happening underground. This is, um, you know, a couple of, of grazes uh, throughout a season. You can see the, the roots are still quite long. They're, they're maybe not as thick. And then as we go over to the right, you know, more continuous grazing, more continuous grazing, um, shorter rest period. So ultimately, if you're keeping down the shoot, <clears throat> you're ultimately killing that root, like I talked about. So different plant communities, and depending on where you are, um, have different considerations for when is best to, um, to graze. So these, again, guidelines, but for example, tame pastures are a little more resilient. <coughs> They're designed to be grazed, and they can typically, can typically be grazed more than once in a season. A native grassland, so ones that, um, native grasslands are one that's <coughs> not been, um, not been broke or uh, intentionally seeded. They typically are best grazed once during the season. Forested patch, pastures, same thing. And then riparian areas as well, typically, uh, typically grazed once uh, throughout the season. And we're stuck, okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to touch on tame pasture just a little bit because I imagine um, many of you have such such places. So this would be um, areas that have been seeded particularly for grazing, or they have species like Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome, meadow brome, um, maybe some red clover, that sort of thing uh, within them. And again. When we put numbers on these types of things, they really are just guidelines because it really does. All. You also have to consider, you know, how much moisture you're getting, um, the condition of the uh, of the pasture, that sort of thing. But a good guideline um, on those types of tame pastures would be, um, you know, when that plant has grown up to be about six inches of growth. And so, the longer you delay in the springtime, that off on a tame pasture that will allow you to usually gain some extra days uh, towards the end of the season. So that's just a guide, you know, if your grass is, you know, gets up to that six inches tall, it might be, uh, might be ready to go, but if it's a drier year, it's gonna happen slower and uh, you might have to, you know, continue feeding a little bit longer into the season. So because these tame pasture species are designed to grow, um, to grow faster, they typically don't have um, a, you know, a super deep, um, deep root, but they have enough root to keep that plant going if it's managed properly. Um, in the spring, they're they're growing fast, and um, you know, if you're doing rotational grazing, you might be able to move a bit faster throughout um, the early the early season. Um, and when I with this 
that this slide, I think, you know, it says spring, but really what we're talking about is like the early summer, uh, early summertime. So like end of May, beginning of June, typically. And then as the summer goes on, uh, the plant starts to slow down. And so it doesn't regrow as fast. And so um, you'd need to provide again, longer rest periods. So it's really about, you know, thinking about the plants that you have and not just moving based on the calendar, um, but looking at how the, you know, how is that plant responding? How is it, how is it growing? Now, many of you may have heard about, you know, sort of the term overgrazing. So basically what that means is it's almost, it's mostly as a result of animals biting a plant again um, before it's had a chance to, uh, to grow up or recover from that first grazing. But also grazing a plant too close to the ground can also be harmful. So um, just in this photo here, you can see that there's, you know, as grasses grow in particular, there um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them have, you know, their growing points further up the plant. And so, <clears throat> so grazing um, up taller sort of allows that plant to to keep that 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 more leaf more leaf material up there. If we some if we bite down too low, then you end up. Um, with particular bunch grasses having a, a you know a bunch of uh, buds down at the bottom and that plant has to grow from that that bottom point so it doesn't get up um, as tall so it really does depend on the type of grass that you have so the fourth principle is going to be about distribution so this is whether or not you've got a natural water body on, on the property or um, you know, maybe, maybe in the yard, the concepts are, are still the same. So obviously animals need water as part of their, uh, part of their, their daily needs. And so if you've, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about you know, riparian areas more specifically as we go, but the idea being that you wanna, there are tools and ways to help the animals go to places they might not go on their own. That's really what distribution is. So where do animals prefer to graze? Well, typically, if we think about, you know, free choice, that's the place they're gonna go most often. And, you know, they're just sort of, they're drawn to those places. So those are these primary ranges. So like number one here. Secondary range might be where livestock tend to, they, know that there's the, they just get into it, they lightly graze it. And then tertiary ranges are ones that they, even though there's, there's, there might be forage there for them, they generally are not gonna go there for whatever reason. And then non-use ones are places that, that they're not going to, going to utilize. Now on a small, you can have this sort of variety on a small land holding just as much as you can um, on a larger land holding. So the idea of distribution is putting in tools that help to um, give you control over that primary range. So in this example up top here, you know, if you put a fence um, sort of on this right hand side, now this tame pasture here, we'll just say it's a tame pasture uh, with the water is now, you know, they can graze there for when you want them to graze. With that fence there with a the gate in it, now this side can rest and you can ultimately then, when you turn them into here, this sort of original secondary range now becomes primary because it's close to the gate, it's close to water and where they maybe weren't getting to at all, they now have sort of a reason or an opportunity and a, um, to go further and utilize that, that forage that might be, uh, might be further out. So that's kind of the idea of distribution. And then this gives you, again, control to add that rest or avoid sensitive times. So typically um, animals will select plants that were previously grazed before selecting ungrazed ones. Um, and I know, think about why that might be. Well, it's gonna partly be because every time there's new growth, that's gonna be some pretty lush grass, pretty lush stuff. And so they're always going for the green. So if they're allowed to do what they want to do on their own terms, 
they're often going to go back to the same places. And that's where, you know, these distribution tools um, can help that. So season long grazing is, um, is, a, is a detriment to having a healthy pasture for that reason. And I, those of you that are horse owners, you know, they're instinctively selective, you know, they might only take young mature plants and, and leave some of the older stuff. So um, different animals have different grazing habits as well. So just another example, um, hopefully that's clear on, you, on your screen, um, but uh, water only provided at the north end of this pasture. You know, you can see the green dots. These are GPS collared cattle that show they sort of tended to hang out right in that primary range, which is right around the water, easy to get at, and only a few sort of traveled further out. In, uh, in the bottom photo here, they added a watering system to the south and that allowed them, even though they, they moved the water essentially, they didn't have two systems, they moved it from the north to the south. You can just see how the green dots spread out throughout that pasture. So now they're, they're getting to places that they didn't before. <laughs> and these are places that you want them to get to. So, so incorporating those principles is really about making a plan. So figuring out, you know, what is your resource? How much do you have? What are your risks? What are your opportunities? Creating a map. Google Earth is a great tool. Anybody, if you've got access to online, um, can go on Google Earth and you can draw, you know, draw out your fields, draw out your plant communities, even if it's just one box. Um, the uh, county has access to air photos that, uh, that you can utilize um, as well. So anyone to think about what your, you know, your resource and livestock goals are, you know, how do you work those things together? And then how are you going to monitor and figure out how that works? And then if you have other activities, um, you know, going on on the landscape, uh, you know, does that affect, you know, maybe the timing of, of when you can go into a certain part of your pastures. And record keeping and monitoring is also a big part of this as well. And again, doesn't matter if you got small, small land base or large land base, um, these, these, these things are all important to, to, to think about. So when we're, um, there are some guided, some resources out there to help um, sort of guide, you know, what might be an ecologically sustainable stocking rate for, uh, for your area. And so these are available on the, the um, Alberta Public Lands um, website. And I've got the, the link at, at the end of the, the, the presentation, but it shows you, you know, if you're in, there's also ones for the parkland, Peace Parkland. And it gives you an idea, okay, well, I've got, this type of grass, this type of forest, and it suggests the number of animals that you could have um, on that plant community for uh, an, a suggested length of time. It also takes into account things like precipitation, um, you know, what condition your pasture is in. Is it good? Is it poor? Uh, is it excellent? And then you can multiply the number of acres that you have by the number of horses um, in, that, in that pasture. And then, again, just gives you a little bit of a, of a, of a backup, I guess, or, or a validation of, of what you've got. And I'll get into this a little bit more uh, later on too. So there's also different um, sort of animal unit equivalents they're called. So if you're grazing cows or, you know, um, or yearlings, or horses, or sheep, they each eat a little bit differently, and so you have to account. You have to account in your math for the type of animal that you have. They're basically based on weight, and then um, and then uh, uh, you can adjust for certain things in your um, in your grazing operation. So in this case, this is showing that 30 cows that are about a thousand pounds with calf would be equivalent to 37 and a half um, yearlings, 20 horses, or 115 goats on the same piece of ground.
So if you want to know more about, um, you know, carrying capacity and stocking rates, there's some great resources out there. For example, uh, the Society for Range Management. Um, and it's about the number of livestock a site can support for a specific time and balancing what that animal needs with the plant production and the site ecology. So what do you need to know if you're going to calculate what's sustainable? So type and size of animals, like I touched on, how much area you have, what type of plant is it? Native, native grass, tame grass, right? You can get down to species if you want. Is it forest? How healthy is it? Sort of, you know, how much do you think it's actually growing? What's your utilization rate, right? Because we want to keep in mind that we don't want to take everything every time we graze. We want to be able to leave something behind. And so basically, there's some balance sheets um, th that are out there that can help you, um, you know, sort of uh, devise a plan. Um, in this case, you know, this is what you need for your current livestock herd. So if these are the animals that you have, um, you've put in, you know, what your, your, your cows are, are worth, what your, what your horses, what their equivalent is, how much grazing you need. And then that will give you you know, essentially, what do you need to sustain that that livestock herd, whether it's three horses or 100 cows? Hmm, well, that didn't work very well. This side, if it was not blacked out, <laughs> I apologize, would be what you have. So this would be your land, um, your 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 land your land base. So tame pasture, native pasture, forest how many acres, what the suggested stocking rate is for that plant community. And then the bottom line is if you have less than what you need, then you might need to reduce your stocking rate or do supplemental feeding longer or something like that. So are there any questions on the principles? If you do, you can put them into the chat box and you can do that, put questions in throughout the, the talk as well. You can also feel free to unmute and speak if you prefer that as well. Nothing so far? Uh, nope, nothing in the chat. Okay. Well. So let's talk now a little about a little bit about you know how to incorporate um, incorporate those principles. So if you do have just one pasture, you know, so season long grazing is basically you got one spot or one, one area of land and the animals are gonna be in there uh, the entire time. Water and supplemental uh, distribution is going to be key as well as uh, the number of animals uh, that are out there. So again, some guidance on um, you know, what you're trying, to, uh, what you're trying to, to leave behind. You wanna take about 10 to 20% during the growing season and, and leave the rest. The, um, the caution with the season long grazing, like we've talked about before, or continuous grazing is another term for it, is that the animals may continue to go back to certain places um, just to take those certain plants back. So you might need to, again, you know, supplemental feed, for example, um, only have people only have put the animals out on pasture a couple of times a day, as opposed to leaving them out there for the whole entire, you know, season. And if the pasture is in poor condition to start out with, if you want to try and rejuvenate it, you might need to shorten that graze period and allow longer rest periods. So ways that you can 
sort of manipulate or improve that distribution would be through temporary fencing. So this would be um, electric fence, could be, um, you know, could be just step in posts, might be permanent posts, but with just with uh, with single or couple wires um, or, or tapes, depending on, on what, 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 what you like to use. And so you can help sensitive areas or help, again, just plain old distribution by just putting in one fence. And if it's temporary, you can move it. You can, um, you know, if you're not quite sure, it's flexible and gives you um, a number of different options. So this can work quite well for riparian areas. So um, basically gives you a, a way to, to provide rest to that creek bank area or to that uh, wider riparian zone. The idea of rotational grazing is, and I've, you know, I've alluded to moving animals um, already, because that's, again, one of the one of the, the most effective ways to to help implement those principles. Um, but basically what uh, what rotational grazing is, is having areas that you graze, areas that you leave, and that you uh, then move the animals around um, the the different paddocks or different pastures throughout the season. So in this particular example, you know, this, this area is being rested for the year. This is gonna get grazed first. And then these two deferred fields just means that they're being, um, you know, the first pass on them is gonna happen later in the season. And so if you have the luxury of a, of a number of different types of plant communities, like forest and tame pasture, and maybe a creek or a wetland riparian area, the idea might be that you can go on to the tame pastures a little bit earlier in the season to avoid the sensitive periods on native rangelands, which tend to be spring um, and later in the year. So that's the idea of, of being complementary. So, um, because you have a tame pasture, that, um, that just gives you a little more flexibility. So when you're thinking about, um, you know, sort of how to implement a, a grazing management plan or to think about um, the different, uh, different principles, uh, think about, you know, that stocking rate and, and carrying capacity, you know, is, is sometimes one horse is too many, just like sometimes 300 sheep is too many. It all depends on pasture condition, type of plant community you have, and, um, you know, and, and then throw in variables like weather and, and precipitation and all that. Um, it, all, it, all, it all works together. So uh, thinking about how you can improve livestock distribution. So basically giving you more control of where the animals are when. Delaying getting out on pasture um, as long as you can um, in the spring. And then, um, you know, sort of rotating through the pastures uh, throughout the summer, um, uh, having that op opportunity to, to rotate and give pastures different types of rest. Oh, stuck. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about riparian areas now, just to sort of focus in um, a little bit about how these practices and principles uh, relate to uh, areas around water. So the first sort of, you know, thing is, well, what is riparian? Well, it's basically that transition zone between the open water and the, um, and, um, and the uplands. So lakes and wetlands have this transition zone that is unique. Uh, streams and rivers have them. So floodplains, shorelines are all different types of riparian areas and peatlands can be riparian too. So it's essentially that connection between land and water. And it's the water that influences the soil and the vegetation. So in riparian areas, you find, you know, things like sedges or slew grasses, you know, willows, cattails, those are all types of plants that you wouldn't find, you know, at the top of a hill, for example. Certain types of willows anyways. So that uh, presence of, of water makes them a little bit more sensitive and a little bit um, 
different in terms of, of, of how, we, how we manage them. And so why these areas are so important is because they are contributing to a couple of different things than the uplands are. So the uplands, we talked about the litter and the ecological function of rangeland. Riparian lands do the same sorts of things like keep the soil cool, um, you know, help retain moisture, that sort of thing. But they also help with recharging groundwater um, because they're, they're often connected right to an aquifer. They help to uh, reduce and dissipate energy that water has that causes erosion or causes, you know, high peak floods and can cause damage that way. They're also uh, super, um, super productive. So they, they grow a lot of stuff because of that presence of water. And they also provide habitat for a lot of different things. And when they're performing all those functions, basically they're able to provide not only grazing opportunity and forage, but a whole bunch of other things, cleaner water, you know, recreational opportunities, uh, healthy soil, nice places to go and look and watch and see wildlife or look at plants, um, hunting opportunities, fishing opportunities, as well as that, you know, sort of, you know, flood and drought mitigation as well. And so when riparian areas and, and other rangelands are, are healthy and functioning, you know, they've got lots of vegetation on them, a lot of different variety of vegetation. The plants have deep and binding roots. Um, you don't see a lot of exposed soil or, or bare ground, you know, just basically bare dirt. Um, the, the soil is not compacted. Um, it, it's able to, to, you know, sort of absorb things and, and, and soak in like a sponge. And so the photos on the, 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 I'll say the left side of the screen, you know, those are examples of healthy riparian lands that are, are kind of shrubby um, grass types. And then, you know, an unhealthy situation would have, you know, maybe something more like this, more bare, bare, more bare ground, shorter plants, um, plants with, with funny, you know, mushroom shapes. And so touched on, you know, some of some of the benefits um, of riparian lands, which also includes providing water for livestock. Um, you know, more moisture often means uh, more forage production, more yield um, from the crops, um, and then you know different different opportunities as well, right through you know erosion control, uh, flood and, uh, prevention, and resiliency. And then some of those not so obvious ones are you know, the things that we typically can't see, um, you know, not recognizing that, you know, maybe a flood impact wasn't so, wasn't so dramatic because we had more healthy wetlands, had better stream, uh, streams, stream floodplains that were able to, uh, you know, stream was able to get out onto floodplain and recharge groundwater, slow that water down. So these riparian areas, you can imagine, um, are a magnet for livestock and wildlife because of that, um, you know, food, water and shelter. It's all right there. It's typically at the bottom of the hill, so easy to get to. And so that attraction to riparian areas, particularly in later in a season, for example, uh, can be quite a bit higher because as the uplands dry out, there's still lots of times moisture down in that bottom, which means there's, there can be more grass. But if we don't think about those things, you know, in our management plan, that can basically cause the riparian area to get overused, um, whether it's through grazing or even through through people use, because um, people are, are attracted to these areas as well. And so it's that overuse that can lead to compaction um, because riparian areas are like a sponge, right? They're the place that water soaks into and, and, and this, Uplands are like are can be like this too, um, but riparian areas are, are a particular consideration for this. That's where the water is. So they're like a sponge, so meaning that they can absorb water. The soils are typically, you know, there's lots of holes in them, the water goes in. If we compact that sponge, then the water just runs off and doesn't have a chance to soak in and provide all those extra um, those extra uh, benefits. So you know, the art of, you know, manipulating animals to do the things that you want to do, um, but also maintain uh, a healthy, uh, healthy ecosystem 
is what we call an art um, and a science. Um, and not every pasture is going to be managed in the same way because everybody's got different goals. Everybody's got different things going on. Um, but again, the principles are, are what's important. So just, you know, reminding what those, what those were, that's, you know, figuring out what your carrying capacity is, providing effective rest after use and effective rest being growing season rest, um, avoiding and minimizing uh, use during the sensitive or vulnerable periods. And again, that'll depend on the type of plant community that you have. And then figuring out how to uh, distribute um, animals uh, most effectively, including if there are areas they should not go to. And these principles apply to uplands and uh, riparian lands. So if you're wondering, you know, if you've got litter, um, typically you can see it. So this is related to that balance and uh, capacity, you know, you can just go down there and scrape it up with your fingers. And if you're able to gather, you know, a good handful, uh, you've probably, you know, you're probably doing a good job at, uh, at leaving something behind. If you don't have that, then you might want to start to look at maybe doing things, some things a little bit differently. And for riparian areas, that carryover is really important because if we think about, you know, what happens in spring, which is plants are dormant, so they're not growing, what we leave behind the year before is going to be the key ingredient for trapping and storing and slowing down sediments um, within that spring runoff. So one of the functions of riparian areas, because they're right close to that water, is to, um, when water slows down, and, you know, floods off the bank, it drops out sediments that might be carrying, you know, contaminants or pollutants that when in the water are poor, um, but when they're on land, then the plants can utilize them. And so when we get out of balance and we don't have that carryover, then, you know, then that's one function that the riparian area can't do, uh, can't do for us. And we can end up with water quality issues or erosion problems. So some strategies for, you know, sort of building that balance um, is uh, related to, and these are, these are, these all overlap, um, but thinking about, you know, creating more than one pasture with fencing and gates um, and closing the gates. So that can be anything from, you know, just a single electric fence to, you know, a more complex um, multi paddock system. Um, if you've got different plant communities, you know, think about actually separating those into your own pasture units. So the idea of like with like. And when you're, you know, when natural uh, food supply is low, so that's the, you know, the growing grass out there is um, to consider supplemental feeding. And then being able to think about how uh, the plant community reacts to, to your grazing use. You know, you know is, it, is it growing back well? Is it taking a really long time? Um, you know, and then what are your other variables that are going on? So the um, idea of rotational grazing, so we talked about this one before, but I just wanted to, um, to point out that when, if we're doing rotational grazing, so whether it's between, you know, just two pastures or four pastures, it doesn't always have to be in the same order every year. Um, you know, maybe this year you rest this portion, graze this one first, defer these two, but next year you rest this one and then go to this pasture first and then this one. So it just kind of changes up the plant response um, by not going in the same way um, every year. So temporary fence, electric fe or uh, permanent fence um, can, can help you achieve that. So this is um, a, a lot of text on that slide, but it uh, basically just um, summarizes, you know, some of those different considerations for rotational grazing. Always, um, you know, you're going to need water or access to water. Um, so you might need to develop some, some, some systems for that. You can consider multiple gate points. And um, again, think about the timing depending on the different types of pastures that you have. Sort of building on that idea, if you do have riparian areas, uh, whether they're lakes or wetlands or streams or rivers, is the concept of riparian pasture. 
So this is ultimately that like with like idea. So if you've got a, uh, this is really, uh, really uh, a good idea um, when you've got a well-defined valley. And so the idea being that, you know, you might fence along the top of the ridge and then your riparian area is its own unit and you can rest it when it's wet you can then graze it later in the summer for one time and then shut the gate and let it rest, for example. So this is kind of be like what a riparian pasture might look like. This one on the right is fenced um, along the top of the crop field um, on both sides. And then the, the, the bottom lands are, are grazed um, when, it's, when it's appropriate. Same on, uh, same on this side. It's often easier to fence a riparian pasture as opposed to a, a corridor fence that might be just right along the bank. Hopefully you can see my cursor following the stream. Um, and it gives you a lot more options. So the, uh, one of the, the risks to doing fencing in riparian areas, particularly close to, is that streams and rivers, uh, particularly, they move. And um, you can often end up losing your fence if, uh, if you've lost some of that, that plant material or uh, you know, had a big flood or, or didn't consider uh, some of those things and where, where you put your fence. So fencing wider uh, reduces some of that risk as well. So if you're gonna do rotational grazing, um, you know, we're putting in riparian pastures, I think, you know, one of the the, 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 the key points is that um, you, you're willing to close those gates uh, from time to time. And, um, and, and that you, you're, you've got a healthy uh, pasture or a moderately healthy pasture that can, can withstand some rest and or withstand some grazing and doesn't need to be rested for a longer period of time. Um, some other limita you know, some of the limitations um, is that you do then have to plan. Um, you need to consider water, particularly if you're on a riparian area and you're going to change their, the animal access to that land, you're going to need an alternative for that. And you want to keep an eye on the trees and shrubs um, because the, uh, um, depending on the type of year, the animals can, can be pretty hard on them. So any of the strategies that, uh, that we talk about, you know, is really about the proper application of the tool and the strategy. And sometimes it's trial and error. And that's how we've learned through Cows and Fish. A lot of the stuff that, that I'm sharing with you today is learning from producers and people that are doing this stuff um, and the science and figure out, they figured out what worked for their situation. And that uh, gives us the opportunity to share um, all these different ideas. So riparian plants, whether they're trees or shrubs, um, react the same to, to grasslands. So that whole idea of keeping down the root, kill the shoot, or other way around, keep down the shoot, you kill the root. And that effective rest is, uh, is through the summer, which, um, which helps to have those plants um, flourish, tap into that groundwater, you know, have deep roots, be resilient in drought times, um, and just be able to uh, to bounce back. Now, generally, the rest period is longer than the grazing period, and that's where some of that, you know, where some of that math and knowing your plant community comes in. When the plant communities are out of balance, you know, these this is where you start to see. These are some of the things like this photograph that you might start to see. You know, you might start to see, you know, clumps of, 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 of sod falling into the falling into the creek that would be, you know, considered unnatural. You know, it, there's a lot of it happening. Um, you don't see any roots um, in that bank at all. The grass is really short. So things like, um, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, which is a typical long grass or a pasture grass, um, even smooth, smooth brome, for example, they don't have a deeper binding root. And so if you get a lot of water energy, that soil generally just washes away. Whereas things like sedges or cattails or some of the more native grasses, they have um, adapted and, and evolved with a deep, deeper root system that can hold things together a little bit better. And then, you know, trees and shrubs uh, do a really good job of that as well. And they also do provide uh, some forage 
Um, a lot of the willows out there and, and red osier dogwood, for example, they hold a lot of their nutrient uh, throughout the year. So, um, so that's something to, to think about is there, there is actually grazing um, potential in forests. So some of the, the strategies, um, you know, they're pretty much the same <laughs> for providing rest. You know, you need to be able to put in some flexibility. So lots of times that is extra water, that is fencing, that is, uh, that is rotation. So in uh, riparian areas, typically there's that, um, there's, a, there's a really good diversity of, of grasses, the wildflowers, as well as trees and shrubs. And so that concept of, of, uh, of going in too early is, um, is, is, is very relevant um, in riparian areas as well. Also, because they are typically wet in the spring. So if they're, you know, riparian areas are meant to be the floodplain, they're meant to be that place where water goes um, in the spring and, in, and in, in, in high water. So if you've um, uh, built in some flexibility to allow them to be riparian areas and be that release valve, and um, you can graze elsewhere, uh, during that time, then that will help with the soil compaction, right? It, it, the, the soils will be, um, because uh, when they're wet, they're, they're more easily compacted, more easily compressed. And so if you can uh, utilize those areas when it's drier, then you reduce that risk. Also want to think about, um, you know, trees and shrubs. You wanna, if you're planting trees, for example, you would want to give them at least three to five years to, to get established and grow up before, um, before allowing grazing into an area. But the, because A, they'll be grazed or browsed, but also they can be trampled. And then also thinking about nesting periods, you know, trying to avoid, um, you know, putting animals in when there might be other things going on, other nesting happening. So the rule of thumb is after July 15th for riparian areas. And when things are out of balance, this just a, a, a visual of some of the things that, uh, that I've mentioned, you know, compacted soil, this pugs and hummocks on the left-hand side, really hard to re recover or restore um, if it gets to this point, you know, ruts and, and vehicle tracks, and ultimately, you know, maybe just losing, losing some equipment. And so funny thing, the strategies for avoiding vulnerable, per vulnerable periods include similar ones that we've already talked about. Um, the one to add in here would be having a diversity of plant communities so that you can you know do some of that that complementary grazing that I had mentioned before. And again, thinking about supplemental uh, feed. Um, so distribution, um, again, law, uh, riparian areas and their associated water sources are often um, you know, one way that that people water their livestock, either through direct access or by, um, you know, using that as the source and then maybe pumping out or, or something like that. So when you're thinking about, um, you know, having uh, water and salt and mineral as two of the, the most, I, I would say the easily, most easily applied uh, distribution tools is, um, is actually really quite handy because you need both of those things anyway. And so it's just how you utilize them. And one thing is, you know, that water and salt don't necessarily, or mineral don't have to be taken together uh, or in, in the same place. So uh, you can utilize them differently. You know, your watering system might be portable or might be, might be permanent, um, but salt blocks are really easy to move around. And so, you know, if there's a, a place they, really don't seem to get to, or you got a, you know, there's a patch of Canada thistle that you don't want. Um, you know, you can put your salt block over there, um, put where away from your watering system, and then it moves the animals around at different times uh, throughout the, throughout the day. And eight times out of 10, animals will drink from a trough, even without a fence. So there's really good, re really well-documented research. Um, that I you know I and my 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 experience with horses is is limited, 
Um, but you know, they don't like to get mucky and, and going in places that, uh, that are uncomfortable to get to same with cows. So if we're providing them with an alternative place to water, uh, then that that's better for them. And it's also then better for uh, your riparian area and for your water body. So a variety of different uh, strategies for, for taking the pressure off of that riparian area and giving you more, again, giving you more flexibility in, uh, in how, it's, uh, how it's utilized. Thinking about, you know, basically the idea would be bring everything as far back uh, from that area as you can. Alternative shelter is another one, bridges, um, you know, drove trails through the bush. And if you have the luxury, I'll call it, of, um, you know, either grazing leases or rented pastures or access um, to a neighbor, that can be another way to help, um, help your land base uh, uh, rest. So all kinds of different watering systems out there, um, you know, some that you've probably seen different ones as well, everything from, you know, complicated um, ones to the just watering bowls in the yard um, to, to portable systems on trailers um, that, uh, again, can be done in a variety of different, different ways, depending on type of animal, how many animals, you know, what are your, light, your site conditions, that sort of thing. And again, thinking about are we applying that tool properly? Um, you know, so in this case, you know, the watering system is what they, they wanted, what they needed but it was put right on the stream bank right at the bottom of the hill. And so I can imagine the, you know, the reasoning for, for doing this, maybe they didn't have enough hose or enough pipe or whatever, um, but from the range management perspective, it hasn't achieved the goal of taking the pressure off of that riparian zone. And if you do have, you know, a larger area where you're, um, that you are, providing, you know, an off-stream watering system for, whether it's solar or, or whatever, um, is you might want to uh, make sure that you're going to check it often, um, have extra batteries, uh, you know, have a secondary storage and a backup plan. And as I mentioned, you know, salt and mineral don't need to be, uh, or salt, mineral and water don't need to be taken together. So utilize that little, that salt block and, uh, and, you know, and move it up farther away from that creek. And there's a variety of other distribution tools uh, that can be used um, as well, such as, you know, again, where you're, where you're feeding, um, temporary fences, portable shelters, uh, actually moving the animals around um, is another, another option. So from a riparian perspective, you know, um, this sort of a situation is, 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 is productive, both from a, a forage perspective, as well as the, the functions of that riparian land. So, you know, you might look at that and think, well, that's not good for grazing, or that's never grazed, but it actually is, uh, is within a grazing system. Um, so this would be what we would call a healthy riparian area. Uh, this one looks looks a lot different, and I think you know intuitively there's not a lot of forage there for livestock. So there's not a lot to eat. Um, the water quality is poor. You know, you notice the channel is is high is uh, is wider and shallower. So this one is just not as productive and doesn't perform those functions as well. So this is what we would call you know an unhealthy pasture. So um, tools and techniques then for outsmarting the cow or the horse or the sheep um, is really about being engaged in how, uh, in how, you're, how they're utilizing that landscape. So having a plan, being able to adapt, thinking about all those principles that we talked about. So, Remember the principles, keep those things in mind. Uh, there's no uh, one right answer, um, except for keeping the principles in mind. Um, because uh, like I said, you know, every situation is gonna be a little bit different in terms of the exact tools that you apply. Um, think about, you know, your, your place, 
about your family, about what you want to be able to do. You might need a combination of things. Um, it's okay to be creative. And it's uh, great to record and monitor what you do. So if you take anything away from this, uh, this, this, this webinar and you want to go try something, you know, maybe take a picture of a particular area on your, um, on your pasture. Make your, right now, then make your change and then go back and take that picture again from year after year. And that will, uh, will help you to sort of see, you know, how things have changed um, over time. Because you're not going to be out there, you know, every minute of every day to see how things are going. And so uh, these are some, uh, some of the resources that uh, we can um, send out um, after the, the webinar. Um, but the Cows and Fish website has uh, a lot of good documents on it um, related to riparian areas and grazing. Um, this top one is those uh, sort of those stocking rate guides if you want to get more into that. And then there's just some other uh, sort of planning documents um, available as well. So there are a lot of, you know, people working on rangelands, um, whether like, like we talked about right at the very beginning, whether it's, you know, large landholders, small landholders, the municipalities, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are available to help, um, you know, sort of take this, um, you're grazing to the next level, your neighbors um, as well. There's lots of times opportunities to get out um, for a field day, uh, you know, get out in the field, actually, you know, learn how to identify what plants you have if you don't know. Um, you know, uh, reaching out to the county, like with Jill uh, Henry here in the County Grand Prairie or Kate Winterford and other resource uh, professionals as well. And even us at Cows and Fish. So um, as I close, um, you know, Cows and Fish is, uh, as I mentioned, not a uh, not-for-profit uh, organization. Uh, we do have um, these members and supporters that help me, um, you know, do the work that I do. And um, also want to recognize uh, County Grand Prairie, um, Alberta, Watershed, Alberta Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Program for providing um, sort of some of the funding uh, for these uh, activities, as well as uh, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Uh, so I am, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I'm, um, I'm based in Edmonton, um, typically. Currently, I'm actually in, in Grand Prairie doing some other work. Um, but um, myself and my colleague um, are, are in Edmonton, and we would be your closest uh, cows and fish contacts. And so you're more than welcome to reach out to us or, um, you know, directly or through, uh, through the county um, as well. So that's all that I have. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Um, that was great. And now we can kind of open the floor to some questions. I see Jill, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about maybe some plants that uh, people could look out for to indicate sort of an unhealthy pasture versus a healthier pasture. If you've mm. got some ideas of plants that maybe people can just kind of visually kind of get an idea of? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think the, some of the most um, obvious ones I'll say would be what we would call your noxious weeds. Um, so your Canada thistles, um, perennial sow thistle, common tansy, the daisies, um, some of the bigger daisies. Uh, those would all be, if you've got a, a, a field full of those, um, something is off in terms of the balance. Other ones that um, are not necessarily, um, you know, noxious or, 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 you know, sort of on the weed act would be even dandelions. Um, you know, if you're supposed to have grass in your field, but all you got is dandelions, that's probably a good uh sign that again something is out of balance whether it the, the the rest of the plants aren't getting enough rest or um or that you know there's something in the soil maybe that's uh that's different so if you're not familiar with those plant species you know that i mentioned um the alberta invasive species council website 
um, gives you some really great photos of, uh, of what some of those look like. Um, or I can even pull up a few um, from, my, from my stash if people want. Great, thanks, um, Carrie. Uh, I also had another question um, just regarding, you know, some, to some toxic plants. And we have a lot of people here that have horses and of course some cattle as well, but are there any really common toxic plants that, you know, maybe are starting to appear at this time of year that maybe people can look out for as well? Mm, yeah, really good question. Thanks, Jill. Um, now this one, I wish I had photos for, um, but one would be water hemlock. So that's a common one near water. Um, it looks like <laughs> it's, it's quite tall. It's got white flowers on the top that kind of are in like an umbrella shape. Yeah, it looks a little bit like cow parsnip. Yeah, if you're familiar with that. A fine, it's a native plant, it's totally fine. Yeah, and if you if you look at the, you know, the cow parsnip has uh, has a big leaf like your hand, the water hemlock is going to have um, finer, like a lot smaller leaves and they're more finely toothed. And if you get right down to it and look at the, uh, the veins on the leaf, they, they kind of go right down into the valley of that leaf. So, um, so that one you want to avoid, it's toxic. The whole plant is toxic, um, which is another reason why you want to avoid spring grazing, um, in riparian lands, um, for sure. Um, the other one that can often uh, show up, not so much in riparian areas, but sometimes in forested or other pastures would be like larkspurs. They're a purple flower. Um, those, can be, those can be hazardous. And then the other one that comes to mind would be tansy. Um, it has some um, toxic properties in it as well. And that's the, the, the tall plant, lots of branches with the yellow uh, sort of button-like flowers on top. Great. Yeah, no, that's really um, good information because I know, uh, you know, there's lots of acreage owners. Um, and we get a lot of questions about, you know, different types of plants, different times, you know, people assume that their plant is toxic, but it's actually fine. So, mm -hmm. so we'll be sending out some information about that later on as well. And, you know, we can put a plug in maybe for our uh, field day. <laughs> coming up on July the 12th, um, where we'll actually be able to get out into the field um, ourselves and the county um, to identify and, and get hands on on some of these plants so that you can get a sense of what's good and what's not. Yeah, and I know last year, um, specifically in at the end of June, beginning of July, we had a real heat wave. So that's something that we never had that type of temperature we had in the forties, um, you know, for a week. So that really stressed the grass and the forage for sure. Mm -hmm. So are, do you have any ideas um, just regarding, you know, in the event that we are going to be getting the same kind of heat, uh, some strategies for people, you know, to kind of protect their grazing land or, you know, just keep an eye on that. Yeah, that's a that's such a tough one, um, particularly if you have a limited land base and you don't have the ability to go, you know, to go somewhere else. Um, really, you know, it, it comes down to potentially if you can divide your fields, um, you know, into more than just one. The, you that you might be able to uh, to get some some relief on uh, for for those dry times um, because the plant is going to slow down the way that it grows. Um, <laughs> supplemental feed would be your, your another option, um, which I know can be can be another stress another challenge because the you know the cost of that. Um, and then the, 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 the third option that nobody likes to talk about, um, would be, you know, can you either 
move those animals somewhere else, you know, maybe you can rent out a, a pasture or, um, oh, or sell them, <laughs> um, which is not a, is not a great option. Um, but ultimately if you don't have the forage capacity to support that animal anyway, it's going to stress everything. So providing as much rest and you and utilizing as much of this spring moisture, you know, get hold on to as much of this spring moisture as you can by by allowing those plants to grow now um, might be your best option. Excellent. Well, thanks, Carrie. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Carrie? Uh, she's basically a wealth of knowledge and we're happy to have her uh, in our county for the next couple of days. Um, I do see a question in the chat here. It says, um, so to clarify, the only thing to do for compaction issues is rest for the pasture. Um, did I miss more information on this? My speaker did keep cutting out at the end because of the rain. Can that person explain compact, what kind of compaction they're talking about? Um, maybe I can actually show something here. Let's see. Um, is it like that kind of a compaction? Um, I don't see your screen, Carrie. Oh, you don't? Oh, weird. Well, you know, because that would be too easy. How about now? Um, she said horses grazing the same areas over and over. Over and over and over. Yeah. <sighs> Rest is going to be probably your most long-term option there. Um, if it is is a type of a situation where um, you know you could potentially rejuvenate the pasture by um, adding you know not uh, maybe some natural fertilizer to it either manure or um, you know something like that it's still going to require rest to help those plants uh, plants get going if you could potentially like till it up and replant it if it's a tame pasture situation um, and sort of try and start over from scratch. Um, but there's, there's, there's risks and time, um, associated with that, uh, with that as well. So, um, so, so, so really, yeah, rest is your, is your ultimate long-term goal. And yeah, I don't, I don't know that situation, um, but yeah, you potentially could, like I said, you could, uh, you could till it up and reseed it. Um, that's not my ex area of expertise, uh, but, uh, but you're still going to be dealing with potentially a depleted soil resource uh, from that, uh, from that situation as well. So Try rest. For Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, try rest if you can. So we have a few more minutes. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to put it in the chat or else you can uh, just unmute your mic. Oh, I see one here. Um, I have the same issue in an area. Sonia with the county has suggestions for this. Okay. Yeah, we can always get people in touch with Sonia who is our egg fieldman as well. Yeah, and then put me in touch with her too. Um, because I'd be curious what else she is suggesting. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Or maybe this person can can add in some of her some of the comments. You know what kind of suggestions she, uh, she has. Hi there. Um, yeah, I had Sonia out to our place a, a couple years ago because we have creek on one end, um, but the other end of our pasture is, you know, compact, really, really short grass that grows, um, not growing very well. And she suggested planting um, fall ryegrass because it's something that 
can break through hard compact and the roots will go down far and create space for the roots of the grass that you have on top to be able to uh, to grow down further and help rejuvenate it. So um, I'm trying that this year. I cut off one acre of our pasture and uh, tried to score it up a little and planted some fall ryegrass to see how that works. When I spoke with um, Fosters, who uh, is a local seed producer, they did caution me about that in the sense that depending on what grass you have, it can outcompete it. And then, um, and the fall ryegrass doesn't grow back the next spring. It's, it's an annual thing. But I kind of figured, well, I'm not out anything. If it, if it doesn't outcompete it and helps rejuvenate it, great. If it out, out competes it and I have to replant it, but it's at least rejuvenated that area's soil, then I'm still ahead. But I'm doing that in a phased approach instead of going whole hog on our land, just in case it does out compete what I have and I need mm -hmm. to do some replanting or we have a, a drought again or whatever. But I'm quite excited to try this. Sonia had said that she'd, um, I think she said it was her sister that she had do it and it, and it worked really well for that. And Excellent. I'm on nine acres with four horses. So uh, I have a feeling I'm in the same boat as, as uh, the person who's asking the question. And Sandra, are you in the Grand Prairie area? Yes, just out by Wembley. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's a good point. Um, definitely you could add different species. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for that reminder. That's, that's a good idea. And I'll just sort of add the one other little thing is that... Um, you know, you can put the horses on it midsummer. So it's not like you have to cut that area off for the full year. Um, give it like eight weeks once it starts growing and then you can put the horses on to graze. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully you get a good grow. You get a good growing season for grass this year. Oh, I tell you, I'm, every time a cloud goes by, I hope it rains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that's where that trial and error comes in too, right? Um, so that's that's good. Yeah, definitely let uh, let folks know how that goes. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll give everyone just another minute or so, but otherwise we'll look at wrapping this up here soon. And just a reminder again that um, it is recorded. So this will be posted. It usually takes a little bit of time uh, to get it Kind of downloaded and put up to the county's youtube page but um next week early next week hopefully it'll be up and i'll send everyone kind of the link so that you can go and watch the video and um yeah i'll also just send a bit of a few of the resources that carrie mentioned at the end of her presentation as well as her email so if anyone has any um questions they can follow up with her and um one other thing while i'm at it um, we, we have carrie here tomorrow doing an in-person beaver workshop in beaver lodge so if anyone is available and wants to learn a little bit about how to kind of live with beavers in the landscape um, share some stories and yeah just learn some kind of management practices then that's going on at the beaver lodge egg barns from one to five and then you can come a bit early for lunch as well if you'd like yeah thanks for that kate and i think we'll also um we'll send out a little bit of an evaluation form um, as well, when you're sending out the the links um, for folks, and if you could, if you wouldn't mind filling that out and sending it back to us, um, those that are on the the webinar today, that would be awesome. Gives us some feedback in terms of you know what other information you might like to see in the future, what you thought of this one, um, and uh, and hopefully we can get together again in the field sometime. All right. Well, thanks very much, Carrie. Um, that was great. And hope to see some of you tomorrow uh, in Beaver Lodge. There is a link on the county website that you can register on. And yeah, we'll have our very, or I guess our second, but our first in-person web or session with Carrie in two years. So <laughs> it'll be good. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you everybody for your for your time and for hanging in there. And um, I hope you learned something and, and take something uh, valuable away and can follow up with other resources um, from this uh, from this event.
All right, thanks everyone. Yep, thanks, have a great night.